Hello, everybody. My name is Ronnie Abergo, and I'm the founder of the Human Library Organization. And it's great to be back in Seoul. And so first, I wanted to just say thank you for the invitation to contribute to this important forum on rewriting democracy. And obviously, a very special thank you to SBS for ensuring the space for these crucial conversations. It's not common that broadcasters will engage in this kind of community commitment, and especially uh, for the very warm welcome from the Korean people. It is indeed a sad period to be here, and my heart and thoughts go out to all those affected by the tragic events last weekend in Itaewon. Uh, my condolences to all of you. My message is one a bit more positive, because 22 years ago, I created a library that could try and help us change the way we understand each other. We live in very polarized times right now, but this library is put in the world to provide us all with a safe space and opportunity to learn without being judged, and perhaps for us to learn how to unjudge. We started in Denmark in 2000, and since then, we've been fortunate to distribute this idea to more than 80 countries around the world, including South Korea. Like, this is not my first visit. I was here in 2014 working with the Hope Institute to try and get this idea into civil society. But since the very first event, it's been clear to me that all societies could benefit from having a safe space where we can explore our diversity. Some of the earlier speakers talk about inclusion and diversity and understanding, and basically this library very much focuses on providing that opportunity because the point of the human library is to provide access to people and conversations that we normally do not have. Perhaps because of our cultural norms, or maybe because our social norms forbid us to engage in these issues without a clear invitation. Like, if I was very fat, how many people would come up and ask me, why did you get so fat? Basically, we're raised to be polite. We're raised to be respectful but also this prevents us from sometimes addressing the elephant in the room, from talking about difficult issues and having conversations that we need to have. So no matter where in the world you live or where you grew up, um, there are issues that we all need to know more about and groups in our community that suffer because we do not have enough knowledge about them. Our ability to be inclusive and understanding and accepting of others really depends on us having access to information and to be able to connect with members of different groups in our community. The taboos that we don't want to talk about, the challenges that we face are not always easy, but it's necessary for a more inclusive approach and for our communities and democracies to counter the polarization that's created through, in part, the political process. Some politicians have learned that playing us against each other actually can bring them into power. We've seen that. Democracy is not to be taken for granted, and it can easily be manipulated by those trying to pit us against each other. It's often said that a society and a democracy is never stronger nor better than its ability to protect its weakest members. And so we do face yet another serious challenge, not only the lack of participation, but also the manipulation of our democracies. One based on our ability and willingness to accept our fellow human beings, and being more specific, the ones who are not like us. How do we get there where we can embrace people that we disagree with? So the ones we do not agree with and the ones we do agree with come, you could say, as brothers. And, and somehow what we need to do is find, help each other find common ground. And this is what the Human Library is all about giving you a safe space where you can potentially find common ground, rekindling with our humanity, and seeing beyond our differences, and trying to better understand how and in which ways we are different. We're not all the same, but that's what makes us stronger. Now, at our library, I must stress, we're not working for tolerance, because obviously, who wants to be tolerated? We're working for acceptance. Acceptance achieved through understanding. If you understand me better, you're more likely to accept me. And honestly, who wants to be tolerated? I may not agree with you, but I do understand you. And I respect your right to be you 
as I ask that you respect my right to be me and to disagree and feel, think, and believe differently, whether it's religion, culture, political beliefs, whether it's my orientation. At the library, we're also not working to promote diversity because diversity is already here. We're also not going to tell you that you're right or you're wrong. We're just here to provide you with a learning opportunity. Opportunity to learn about other groups in your community, but also to learn about yourself and about a lot of different people that normally you would not have the social courage to go up and talk to. Groups we don't have access to because we don't want to offend. So what is a better framework than the institution of the library? A place where everyone is welcome and everyone is equal. Think about it. What is more inclusive than the library? Now, what you do with the knowledge that you may gain from a human library is in your hands. That's entirely your responsibility. I'm not going to tell you what to do or how to think. I only want to help you gain access to the information that can help you think differently, qualify your opinion, provide more perspective, and perhaps better inform it so that when you're deciding, when you're navigating diversity, you're doing it on an informed basis and not because of what you heard somewhere else, but because you actually met the person. So we're a neutral space, just like your community library. You can come down, you can borrow a transgender, you can borrow a Trump supporter, you can borrow a Muslim or a Jew, an agnostic, a homeless person or a disabled. We create learning spaces in educational institutions around the world. We create them in public spaces, such as community libraries and festivals, universities. But we also create learning opportunities for some of the biggest companies in the world, from Heineken to Haleon to McDonald's, to the World Bank, to Lloyd's Bank, to eBay, Intel, Meta. They all engage with us. Yesterday, we had readers visiting the human library from Amazon. So all of these companies and many more are looking for ways to create more inclusive organizations, build more empathy, and a better understanding of our diversity. We're active in New Zealand, Canada, Peru, and the US. We're in Belarus, Ukraine, Italy, and Denmark. We work in Tunisia, Somalia, the United Arab Emirates. We're in Japan, Australia, Vietnam. We're all around the world working to embed this learning approach and secure safe spaces where we can learn about our own unconscious bias. Because at the Human Library, we want to invite you to unjudge someone. Because we recognize and respect the fact that all of us judge. You judge me when I came in here. I judge you when we talk. We must recognize that it's part of our human instinct to make risk assessments. It's a survival instinct. If something is different, if something is, is out of the norm, we're going to make an assessment about it. We're going to make a judgment. And when we make these risk assessments, and we have to do it all the time, even in traffic, uh, and more specifically now, when there are new people or strangers around us, then we have to take responsibility for our judgments. Because we judge everyone. We judge the people close to us, and we judge people from a distance. We judge people from our community, family members, parents, brothers and sisters, and our partners. My girlfriend didn't call, she didn't text me, what's she doing? Uh, we judge our children, I know I do, and we judge other people's children when they don't behave in public. We judge our neighbors, our coworkers, our team members, and our friends. So within each and every one of us, there is a little judge living, <laughs> telling us about other people and informing our opinion. And all of this really is unavoidable. So I don't want to shame you for being a judge or for being judgmental. But we have to train ourselves to try to stop passing such hard judgments on others and give people a chance to show us who they are before we judge them. Recently, I was visiting the United States. I was in Los Angeles talking to a friend about the homeless situation because if you've been to Los Angeles, you'll see that there are encampments of homeless people on the streets. And this is where their house is. It's a tent on the street somewhere in the middle of LA. So in one of the most wealthy countries in the world and in one of the most wealthy states, California, thousands of people are living on the street. So my friend who's an American, he felt very strongly that the homeless situation was mostly due to their drug problems. And I try to argue that the drug problems might also be a consequence of untreated mental health issues 
that then led to homelessness. No matter which answer is the right one, the fact remains the same. In some of the richest nations in the world, we're letting people sink to the bottom of society, leaving them with no roof over their heads, no food on their plate, and no access to health care. And the same can be said for many other countries than the US, most of whom are said to be a democracy. But what about my democratic right not to starve to death? What about my right to get help when my mental health or my financial situation has collapsed? Or like we're seeing now with the energy crisis in Europe, people can't afford to pay for their heating in their house or they can't afford the price of gas. What happened to empathy for our fellow man? I mean, there is one race on this planet and that's the human race. And in a not too distant past, we all needed each other to survive. We needed the whole village to cope, to evolve and to build our community. But now with almost 8 billion people, we're more likely to avoid each other if it looks like it's trouble, if it looks like it's, it's going to be demanding of me, or it's going to be uh, requesting my resources, my time. So in a way, we're no longer working for the same goal, and we're even still at 2022 going to war. A few days ago, one of the most wealthy men in the United Kingdom became the new prime minister. But did anybody ask the people of the United Kingdom if they wanted this man as prime minister? No. Instead, a small group of parliamentarians decided who was going to be the next prime minister. Is he representative of the people? I don't know. We'll see when the next election comes. But it's 80 million people that they didn't ask. And problems like this are not supporting democracy. It's undermining our confidence and our trust. It takes away legitimacy and it brings very little connection to the working people. This new leader was installed, you could say, without a public mandate. And at least, you know, the system that there are two parties. In my country yesterday, we had the national parliament. There was the, the elections for the national parliament and 12 parties was elected to go into con to, to, to the parliament. So more representative, special interests, sure, little groups, even the vegan party almost got elected through a different construction, but it's more representative. Everybody can see themselves inside the democracy. And I'm not saying Denmark is perfect. There are a lot of problems in my country, but uh, it's more inclusive, at least more inclusive than the two party system. Now, what happened in the UK and what's happened elsewhere is very similar to non-democratic regimes. Uh, recently in China, there was a big party congress. That's where they elected their leadership, not by the people. In the US, the former president still refuses to recognize a democratic decision made by a majority of Americans and continues to push a big lie of election fraud, which is causing great polarization and divide within the, the people of the United States. And like I said, in Denmark, the election this week to parliament was marred by media campaigns against certain politicians and generally an overload of promises made by politicians that want to be elected, but they know only too well that a majority of the promises that they make cannot be turned into policy. It's simply not realistic, also not helpful for our democracy. So I think with the help of fear mongering, war mongering and polarization, a wide range of political forces have made their way into power in democratic states. Italy, Sweden, Poland, Hungary. They're just a few examples from Europe, but the list is much longer. And as the professor showed us in the early beginning, democracy is still very young. Uh, and the tradition of democracy is, is very new and it's a fragile system. We need to protect it. It is never stronger than our willingness to compromise to find solutions together where nobody gets everything that they want, but we get part of what we want. But if we start compromising with the democratic principles in order to achieve a greater good just for ourselves, then we're on the road to really despair. I was sad to hear the seriousness and graveness uh, situation of the, uh, the parliamentary situation in Korea. I think you, just like many other countries, are facing a challenge of people surrendering their involvement in the system. Uh, in my country yesterday, the largest number of blank votes ever registered and the lowest participation of voters in a national uh, election 
in the history of registering for the national elections. So participation is going down, confidence is going down, and it's because the rules are being bent. The laws are being put into place to discriminate against certain groups and even paint them into the reason for the problem. In my country, I'm, I'm sad to say that for a long time, our politicians have blamed foreigners for many challenges, and they are sort of the reason for the rising crime rates, they are the reason why the economic situation is difficult, and so on and so forth, and it's not true. But finding a scapegoat to draw attention away from the responsibilities of the politicians and distracting the voters from the more important part, finding solutions, finding solutions together. So I know that in South Korea, you have had similar periods and incidents, prompting a resistance to people from the outside, and democracy can so easily be manipulated, so it's up to us, all of us who are actively engaging, to find ways to better bolster and safeguard this framework around our form of rule. And one of our approaches is to try and dismantle fear through dialogue. Let's meet the people we think we don't like, let us work to diffuse the polarizing talks of politicians by bringing the relevant people together and have them sit down and learn about each other. It's very difficult to hate someone that you now know or understand, even when you disagree with them. I, for one, shall be the first to admit that I've lost much time and much opportunity from judging others without really knowing about them, but rather just assuming or believing in the hearsay. So for us to find a sustainable future together and a path forward, not just for us as a race, like I said, the human race, mankind, we must work better together to understand each other, to respect each other, and not allow for those seeking power to profit from pitting us against each other. We can't allow for anyone to rise to fame or come into power when it's built on the shoulders of intolerance or polarization. We need to strengthen our democratic rule, and in order to do that, we must first make a conscious decision to accept each other in all of our diversity and differences. So at the Human Library, we're working tirelessly to provide these learning opportunities for democratic conversations, and we will continue to do so for many years, but time is running out, both for me and for the planet and the people living here. We must act now and refuse to be manipulated. We must rise as one people and allow us all to be representatives of our communities, our country, and our civilization, and ensuring universal human rights for all mankind. As you see in the image behind me with one of our open books from South Korea, we welcome all backgrounds, religions, gender orientations, and much more as part of the human library. We would love to see more communities do the same, because acceptance through understanding, leading us to a lasting mutual respect for each other, is to the benefit for all involved. So you and me, and everyone in this room and those who are watching the stream have an opportunity to become part of the solution and to help make the situation better. I think it is our common responsibility. And for those of you in attendance here at the SBSD Forum, I encourage you to visit the Human Library Book Cafe, which is open all day in the conference hall, right next to the forum venue, for your opportunity to borrow a human book, connect, and perhaps unjudge someone. I wish you good luck. I want to thank you for your attention. Gamta Hamnida.